Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for joining us for today's lecture. Today, we're going to be talking about science and clinical research of APRV using the TCAB method. We want to welcome you, both myself, Winnie Sivilak, alongside me with Ed Coombs. Here at Dreger, we are very excited to be able to bring you this lecture this evening. I'd like to first introduce Gary Neiman. Mr. Neiman is a professor and, and senior research scientist in the Department of Surgery at Upstate Medical University in Syracuse, New York. In addition, the Director of Cardiopulmonary and Critical Care Laboratory, which is a large animal translational laboratory investigating the pathophysiology and treatment of septic and traumatic shock. Gary's group studies the pathogenesis and treatment of acute respiratory distress syndrome and ventilator-induced lung injury. In addition, we also have Dr. Nader Habashi. Dr. Habashi is a professor of medicine at the University of Maryland School of Medicine, an attending physician in a multi-trauma clinical critical care unit and the clinical medical director of respiratory therapy department at Shock Trauma in Baltimore, Maryland. Let's go ahead and start our conversation with Gary. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, uh, Winnie, for that very nice introduction. And uh, I would like to thank the uh, AARC and Drager Medical for inviting me here today or this evening, afternoon, uh, to discuss uh, my work at Upstate Medical University in my clinically applicable animal uh, laboratory. Um, as you all know, um, all you clinicians know that uh, ventilating a patient uh, with acute lung injury, ARDS, is a very difficult uh, a task. You have to try to uh, both oxygenate and ventilate this patient without causing uh, a secondary ventilator-induced lung injury or billing. Uh, it almost seems like uh, it's a mechanical breath magic to use one mechanical breath and accomplish both of these missions. Um, the other thing I'd like to point out is that uh, um, in the bottom right uh, of the slide here is my email address and our APRV website. And um, uh, please feel free to uh, contact either if you have any questions. So what actually is this magic um, that uh, we need in order to ventilate the patient uh, and oxygenate but not cause a secondary uh, billing? And uh, the answer is science. Uh, we first, we have to understand the, uh, the mechanisms of how the lung actually inflates and deflates. Uh, during mechanical ventilation, how this has changed during acute lung injury, and how the mechanical breath impacts uh, these changes in alveolar and lung mechanics. Uh, so let's first look at how we're doing today. Uh, how are the current protective mechanical ventilation uh, strategies faring? Uh, as you all know, the famous ARMA study published in 2000 uh, tested a uh, tidal volume of six cc's per kilo versus 12 cc's per kilo in patients with established ARDS. And they found that uh, there was a significant reduction in mortality in the patients with the lower tidal volume. So in the year 2000, when the paper was published, uh, the gold standard for ARDS pathology was 31%. But a lot has changed in the 20 years since the ARMA study was published. And uh, although in, uh, in 2000, it was very exciting that uh, this low tidal volume ventilation strategy was going to uh, significantly keep improving uh, and reducing mortality associated with ARDS, uh, sometimes things don't go the way we uh, have hoped. And so uh, in this graph would be the 20 years since um, the established ARMA study was published and uh, looking at ARDS mortality on the y-axis uh, we see in 2000, the gold standard was 31%, and almost all meta-analysis and statistical analyses today show that uh, ARDS mortality is around 40%, which, as you recall, that was the uh, mortality of the high tidal volume uh, group in the ARMA study. You would think in 20 years we would have a, a mortality of less than 31%. <clears throat> so what strategies are used uh, currently um, to try to reduce ventilator-induced lung injury and prevent over-distension of what is termed the baby lung or the normal lung tissue 
uh, in these uh, patients. And uh, essentially, there's just four parameters. Uh, we try to use uh, low tidal volume, uh, keep plateau pressure below uh, 30. Uh, we titrate PEEP to try to uh, uh, prevent recruitment, de-recruitment, or collapse and opening of the lung uh, with each breath, and we use recruit maneuvers. And over the last 20 years, we have used multiple combinations of these parameters, and still uh, we come up with the same results. And uh, insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. So I think after 20 years, we have to start thinking about maybe we should be doing something different. So what is the current hypothesis of ARDS pathophysiology? How do we, what do we think happens when the patient develops uh, ARDS? Well, we know it's a heterogeneous lung injury. Uh, there's areas of instability, areas of edema-filled uh, tissue, areas of collapsed tissue, and areas of perfectly normal healthy tissue. Uh, and the small volume of remaining healthy tissue, which has been affectionately termed the baby lung by Dr. Uh, Gattinoni, um, is, uh, is located in mostly in the non-dependent region seen on CT or X-ray. Um, there's a large amount of collapse and unstable uh, and edema-filled tissue mostly in the dependent region. So really, uh, the, uh, the current ARDS pathophysiology is, is felt to be really uh, twofold. There's normal, healthy baby lung in the non-dependent region, small volume of it, and a much larger volume of collapsed, unstable, and, ed and edema-filled uh, tissue in the dependent regions. <clears throat> so why has, the, if this is indeed the, uh, uh, the pathophysiology, why hasn't the ARTSNET uh, uh, protocol, why isn't it reduced mortality? It seems like it would. If you just reduce uh, tidal volume and it doesn't over distend the baby lung, it seems like that should be highly effective. Uh, so what we have to do is really go back and think about what the problem is. Uh, until we understand what the problem is, it's very difficult to uh, deduce the solution. Uh, in other words, if, you, uh, if you're a mechanic and you don't know how the engine works and it's going to be very hard to uh, fix it once it breaks. <clears throat> so the first thing we've got to question is uh, what if this two compartment uh, baby lung of normal uh, tissue in the non-dependent and uh, injured tissue in the dependent is not the problem? So let's go back and first look at ARDS pathophysiology. And if this isn't true, then maybe low tidal volume, it, then low tidal volume is designed for the wrong disease. So sort of uh, schematically, this is the current hypothesis of ARDS pathophysiology. We have collapsed and edema-filled uh, tissue in the dependent region. Uh, the normal region is uh, healthy and pink. If we put a normal-sized tidal volume into this lung, uh, we're going to over-distend and um, injure this, uh, this normal tissue. And that's the, the, really the, the basic thinking of keeping the plateau pressure and the tidal volume low. Uh, however, there's evidence uh, suggesting that this overdistension theory uh, of the normal tissue is really not the major mechanism driving Billy. And I'm going to show you one publication that was generated in our lab laboratory by Dr. Jane. Uh, he used two groups of animals uh, and targeted with heterogeneous ventilations, uh, a typical ARDS kind of injury. Uh, and he overdistended both of these uh, groups. He had high, uh, high, a very high plateau pressure of 40. Uh, 10 centimeters above the 30, that's felt the safe limit. And in one group, he had high dynamic strain. And in the second group, he also had over distension, but low dynamic strain. And strain just means the change in volume. So essentially, a high dynamic tidal volume and a low dynamic tidal volume. Uh, so this is, a, this is an excised lung after necropsy. And, and what we did is we instilled the detergent to cause injury in the dependent portions. So uh, we know that the dependent portions had an ARDS-like situation. And then uh, the rest of the lung was the normal tissue or the baby lung. And so we could test whether our ventilation strategies uh, protected both of these, injured both of them, or, um, uh, or, or protected both. And here's the, the take-home results. Uh, you can see here we have a, a plateau pressure of uh, 40 centimeters water and a low dynamic strain. And then on the right, the plateau of 40 and high dynamic strain. And you can easily see that uh, even with a high, a very high plateau pressure that in theory would over to the baby lung, we saw very little injury in both the tween injured lung and the normal tissue, uh, both on the gross uh, view and on the cut surface. And in the, uh, uh, in, in, the, in the group with the high dynamic strain, we saw a very great uh, deal of injury and electasis and edema in the gross uh, view and in the cut surface. 
<clears throat> so we concluded from this, along with uh, multiple other studies, that overextension of the baby lung alone uh, does not cause uh, a villi. Uh, surely over uh, high pressures, uh, if you have a high dynamic strain, uh, work synergistically to cause lung injury. So what are the new concepts? What are the novel mechanisms that investigators are, are uh, coming up with uh, to explain the, uh, uh, the problem with billing. And uh, I think in a nutshell, it's regional alveolar strain. And remember, strain is the change in size, uh, but it, regional, not a, uh, a, a uh, uh, one half of the lung is baby lung and one half of the lung is, is, uh, is collapse and edematous. Uh, in this concept, the regional strain is caused by a small pockets of unstable and collapsed alveoli throughout the entire lung, even the lung that looks normal on chest x-ray and, uh, uh, and CT scan. And in this regional lung strain, there's alveolar instability. Alveoli are collapsing and expanding with each breath. And there are something called stress multipliers. And that's when you have um, a, uh, a small pocket of either collapsed or edema-filled uh, alveoli. And what occurs, it, it's, it focuses the stress of, of the mechanical breath around these, uh, these fo focuses of collapse, and it damages the normal tissue surrounding these uh, stress multipliers. Uh, so what knowledge is necessary before we can, uh, from a physiologic basis, before we can uh, come up with some logical plans to reduce villi? Uh, again, we first have to know, know the normal mechanisms of dynamic alveolar change. Uh, if we're a mechanic, we have to know how the engine works. We then have to know uh, uh, what happens when the engine breaks, what happens during ARDS to these alveolar mechanics, and how are these mechanics altered in order to uh, generate a ventilator-induced lung injury. Uh, and once we know the uh, physiologic mechanisms of uh, uh, altered mechanics in ARDS, we can uh, logically deduce a mechanical breath strategy uh, that will actually uh, that that will take these abnormal mechanics and normalize them. And if we have normal alveolar dynamic inflation and deflation, uh, we feel that Billy will be eliminated. So first, let's go back and, and, and see what do al normal alveolar uh, mechanics look like. Uh, and in my laboratory, we have a microscope, and uh, it comes, it can come down on the alveolar surface. And what you're seeing is a rat, a normal rat lung, and all of the individual balls here are, are individual alveoli, and they're being ventilated. And you can see in the two dimensions uh, that we can see with our microscope, there's very little change in the alveolar size with with tidal ventilation, about two percent. So uh, the point being, normal alveoli are totally uh, inflated. There's no areas of instability or collapse, and they change volume very little with ventilation. And we modeled this with hexagons, and uh, with our hexagon model, this is a 2% change in, in each breath. So keep this in mind, this is what the normal alveoli should look like. Uh, so what happens in ARDS when these alveoli, their surfactant deactivation, edema, and these alveoli become unstable? Uh, what does that look like? <laughs> Uh, here we have a rat lung. Uh, you can see on the left is the apical lobe, and on the right, the diaphragmatic lobe. You can see a, uh, uh, a, a line of demarcation, and you can see the lungs obviously being ventilated. The lobes are moving. And notice that you see an alveolar duct, an alveoli collapse on the duct, and with every breath, these alveoli pop open and collapse back. Uh, and this is, uh, that Marcelo Amato said, this was like taking a paper clip and bending it back and forth a couple dozen times, it's going to break. So the uh, very delicate tissues on the alveolar walls are not designed to pop open and collapse like this. And if this goes on for very long, you're going to have a severely injured uh, lung. And we modeled this uh, by collapsing these alveoli in the center. And again, uh, the alveoli in the center are going to be damaged by this paperclip effect being bent back and forth. But since all alveoli are interconnected, notice what happens to the alveoli uh, surrounding it. They're being overdistended and uh, increased dynamic strain with, e with every breath. And if this goes on long enough, these alveoli are also going to be damaged. So uh, this, in, this uh, alveolar recruitment, derecruitment is also asking, acting as a stress multiplier and injuring the tissue surrounding it. Uh, so what are the other stress multipliers other than recruitment, derecruitment? Uh, and let's take a step back. Now, first, what indeed is a stress multiplier? 
And what we have here is a board, and the lines on the board are the lines of force. And we're going to pull on the board in each direction. That's what the arrows are for. We're going to see how much force it takes to break the board. And as you can see, obviously on the board in the far left, uh, it's going to take a great deal of force to break that. However, if we start putting uh, defects in the board, which act as stress multipliers, you can see how the lines of force are concentrated around these defects. And on the the uh, uh, the figure on the far right, it's easy to tell exactly where that board is going to break, right on the peak of that uh, V-shaped uh, defect in the board. And this is the same thing that can happen to lungs. So this is the basic theory of a stress multiplier. Again, looking at our lung, a homogeneous and heterogeneous ventilated lung as uh, depicted by uh, our hexagons. <clears throat> and we can see in the uh, bottom uh, figure that we've collapsed a bunch of alveoli. And notice how the lines of force with your tidal breath are, are focused around that collapsed area and how the, uh, the alve normal alveoli surrounding the stress multiplier are being stretched. <laughs> so we animated this. And you can see again that the, uh, the, the tissue that's being injured is that that surrounds the stress multiplier. And you can see that it's both being over distended and it's is subjected to high dynamic strain. It changes volume greatly with each breath. Both of, uh, both of these um, forces will tend to injure the alveolar walls and uh, um, essentially uh, progressively spread ventilator induced lung injury. Uh, we recently published a paper in the Blue Book uh, analyzing this phenomena, and again, here are our alveoli, uh, our uh, representatives, hexagons. Uh, a is a normal homogeneously ventilated lung. In B, we see a small stress multiplier, and notice the the area of, uh, of the normal tissue that's being uh, over distended and uh, um, and, uh, and, and and large dynamic strain uh, is significantly larger than the stress multiplier. If we make the stress multiplier bigger. Uh, this expands and uh, even bigger and expands further. And uh, we term this uh, phenomena as the poor get poorer, such that as the uh, uh, stress multipliers start getting larger in size, and that's collapse, atelectasis, and instability, they rapidly expand the area of normal tissue that's damaged around them. And so with this knowledge, uh, how, how are we going to reduce uh, Lilia? Well, of course, if we can get rid of these uh, stress multipliers and alveolar instability, I think, will accomplish the mission. And so uh, we've used these components, uh, tidal volume, plateau pressure, peep, and recruitment maneuver. Uh, they haven't worked. So what's missing? And we believe the missing component is time. And that's the time that these components are applied uh, at inspiration and the time that they are exposed at expiration. And uh, a very important concept of this lecture is that uh, parenchymal tissue, lung tissue, inflates and deflates in a viscoelastic system. And engineers teach viscoelasticity by using something called a spring and dash pot. You can see what we have here is a spring connected to a dash in a pot, and the pot can be filled with various viscosities of fluid. If it was filled with water, the uh, the the a dash would move very quickly. If it was filled with honey or molasses, it would move very slowly. And so you can see that we have a fast component. And again, the, the, the red T is the force. Uh, in the case of mechanical breath, the force would be the tidal line. Uh, so the spring um, uh, contract or, or, or moves back and forth very rapidly. And then there's a much slower movement in this, uh, in the dash in the pot. And uh, together, um, these cause a time lag uh, from when the tidal line would be applied and the alveoli and the lung tissue starts to open, and when, the, when during exhalation, when the tidal volume is exhaled, and the tissue would start to collapse. So the key thing to remember in a viscoelastic uh, tissue system, or remember the spring and dash pot, there's a time lag from when you apply the force and the lung's going to open, and when you remove the force and the lung's going to close. <clears throat> so as you all know, uh, Dr. Bashi has uh, come up with this a uh, concept of a time-controlled adaptive ventilation or TCAB method to set and adjust uh, the APRV mode. And uh, the novelty of uh, this strategy is that it uses this component of time to our advantage to open the lung and stabilize the lung and thus uh, minimize ventilator-induced lung injury.
As you're all quite aware, uh, this is the pressure flow curve of a APRV breath that is set and adjusted by TCAV. And uh, sort of the, the, the basic thing to remember for this, uh, this the features of this lecture are that there's a very extended uh, time at inspiration, uh, the long CPAP phase, the T-high, and a very short release phase, uh, also known as the T-low. And, and this is going to play um, in, into the uh, in, into our into the physiologic hand of viscoelasticity, uh, the, the extended uh, CPAP is going to continually recruit alveoli, and the very short uh, expiratory time was not going to prevent is going to prevent alveoli from collapsing. So here we have uh, what occurs uh, in an ATCAP breath uh, during uh, inspiration. So what we do here is we. Uh, 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 we, we, we go up to T high and hold it. And, and here we are on the left, you can see that's during the T high. And as you can see, the spring goes up rapidly, uh, but what happens is the dash to the pot comes up slowly. So you're recruiting alveoli, uh, you recruit alveoli, uh, you recruit alveoli. So alveoli are continually recruiting over this long CPAP or T high phase. And as you can see, uh, over time, you will get, over each breath, you're going to get in a, in a, a, a large increase in recruitment of alveoli. Uh, this is the, uh, this, the whoops. Whoa. Okay, for some reason, I can't see, there it is. So <clears throat> what we have here is a, uh, a rat lung with, uh, uh, that has ARDS. Uh, the, the ARDS uh, class part is pink or is uh, dark red, and the pink is the healthy tissue. Uh, we're going to hold this uh, at inspiration for one second, and uh, which is a typical uh, conventional breath uh, inspiratory peak. And as you can see, there is no change in the red to the pink. Uh, here we're going to have the T care breath. We're going to hold it for approximately five seconds, which is a typical CPAP phase or T high. And you'll see at the exact same inspiratory pressure. Uh, how many alveoli we're going to get re recruiting. So here, as you can see, we're three, four, five, and you can continually see the red going to pink uh, over these five seconds. So the exact same pressure in the CMV and the TCAB breath, the only difference is the inspiratory time is held a lot longer. Uh, so this is, and again, during uh, due to this fiscal elasticity, this is what is um, uh, causing the, the lung to progressively open or to be nudged open over time. On the on the on the uh, class phase, here we go. We have a very short expiratory duration. Uh, you can see the spring moves, uh, but and this is again the T low. Uh, the spring moves, but it moves so fast that it does not give the dash in the pot time to change. So if you uh, exhale for a very short period of time then uh, the dash in the pot won't have time to change, and essentially you won't get any alveolar de-recruitment. As you can see, the alveoli continue to de-recruit de -recruit as uh, seen with the dash moving in the pot, uh, and if you can stop it early, you will prevent all of this alveolar de-recruitment. Uh, here we have uh, the biological evidence for this. Uh, here we have a long expiratory time, and you can see alveoli are collapsing and expanding with each breath. All we did here is shorten the expiratory duration, and we stabilized these subpleural alveoli. So again, showing that the only thing that that um, these that alveolar collapse is very sensitive to the amount of time they're exposed to the lower pressure. <clears throat> And again, one more look. Here's uh, inspiration. Again, the dash uh, moving up progressively uh, in the pot. Inspiratory hold, and we see uh, collapse, and we see that lung uh, collapse opening over the time. Uh, expiration, we, again, we see the dash of the pot going down, and we see uh, the lung doesn't collapse immediately, uh, but over time will. <clears throat> so if we extend the inspiratory time, we're going to get the lung open, and if we keep the lung, uh, the extra time very short, we're going to keep that lung open. So back to thinking about the problem. It appears that stress multipliers and that overdistension of the normal tissue is what causes villain. <clears throat> uh, so the solution, obviously, is, is eliminate the stress uh, multipliers. Uh, the physiology of lung inflation deflation is a viscoelastic system, so we have to use the time at inspiration and expiration uh, during the mechanical breath in order to open and stabilize the lung. Uh, so if we have an extended time, 
An inspiration will nudge lung alveoli open. A very short expiratory duration will not give the lung tissue time to recollapse. Uh, this will eliminate the stress multipliers. And again, we can use uh, the TCAV method to set and adjust APRV to accomplish these goals. <coughs> um, so um, I just want to let, uh, mention that uh, we have been working uh, with this uh, TCAV method of setting and adjusting APRV uh, for uh, over 10 years. And it's, um, um, it, it is the most studied method to set APRV. Uh, and we've uh, done this in very clinically applicable translational animal porcine uh, models of uh, ARDS and multiple organ dysfunction. <clears throat> These are just a list of some of, uh, of the uh, TCAP efficacy studies in the uh, anim these clinically applicable animal models. Uh, and again, you can go to our website and many of these you can download as PDFs. Uh, this is some unpublished data. Um, again, this is a, a very sophisticated ARDS model. It goes for 48 hours. Uh, here we tested late tidal volume, early tidal volume, and APRV as the solid line. Uh, and what we saw is that uh, measuring plateau pressure, that the uh, plateau pressure was elevated uh, as compared to the early application of low tidal volume. That's to be expected because of the extended uh, time at uh, the extended CPAP phase or T high. Uh, but when it comes to driving pressure, we found that the driving pressure remained as low as the uh, uh, group where we applied tidal volume early. <clears throat> um, and uh, when we look at uh, uh, tidal volume, however, tidal volume was much higher, almost twice as high in the TCAV group as it was in the uh, low tidal volume group. It was uh, almost 12 uh, in TCAV and uh, obviously by definition six in the low tidal volume group. So how can you have a high tidal volume and a low driving pressure? It's because compliance remained normal or almost normal uh, with TCAV. And as you all remember, uh, driving pressure is equal to tidal volume divided by compliance. So as long as the compliance is increasing, you can apply a larger tidal volume and it will not increase driving pressure and will not injure the lung. So I think this is the real take-home pictures. This, again, is after one of these very extensive 48-hour uh, ARDS models comparing the TCAV method to the ARDSNET method. Uh, you can see the lung is, is totally inflated and homogeneously inflated. Uh, and again, at the end of the study, we don't set uh, the tidal volume, but the, the lung was uh, taking for the uh, for the CPAP for the uh, uh, T high that we had, the lung was uh, taking in 12 cc's per kilo, but the driving pressure was only nine. And you can see the homogeneity, uh, no stress multipliers in this tissue. Uh, here in the low tidal volume, uh, six cc's over our driving pressure was 27, and you can see the heterogeneous uh, edema and collapse, uh, causing a great deal of stress multipliers. And this is obviously a very sick lung. Now, I think your, your clinicians will be very impressed uh, with this next uh, back in the, the animal, uh, in the TCAV animal that we, they're showing here, that it was 60 liters fluid positive. Uh, we use a fecal clot in the abdomen and we don't control source. So this is a raging inflammation uh, and uh, the, uh, it needs a great deal of fluids and pressors in order to maintain hemodynamic stability. So even in the presence of 60 liters positive, uh, this lung was uh, inflated, dry, and edema-free. Uh, so uh, clinical case, uh, what I'm going to show you is some, uh, some clinical case studies that we have using the TCAP protocol. Uh, and uh, I want to stress that the TCAP protocol is personalized and adaptive, and I think that's one of the beauties of this strategy. Uh, we published this in a, a, just a, a case study in a couple of uh, brain-dead lung donors that had significant lung collapse and were uh, transferred uh, to the TCAB method. And uh, we published this in a review paper in the Annals of Intensive Care. <clears throat> So you can see we put, here's uh, just our simulated, uh, what the lung looked like uh, when we first went on TCAB, it was a collapse, the collapse was reduced at 12 hours and then the lung was finally opened at 24 hours. <clears throat> but when we first applied TCAB, uh, when the lung was still collapsed, we found the tidal volume was 7.3 milliliters per kilo. Uh, remember, uh, TCAB is just CPAP with a release. Uh, so that uh, if the lung is, uh, if the lung is collapsed and uh, has low compliance, you will never, uh, it will never deliver a high tidal volume to a collapsed low 
uh, low compliance lung. Uh, so it, it's very protective and adapted in that way. However, as the lung starts to recruit, the tidal volume starts to go up. Uh, so at the end of 24 hours, our tidal volume was 10, and everybody said, well, that's, that's bad, but it wasn't. So now if we look at driving pressure, driving pressure was 16 when we first went on uh, uh, TCAB, and uh, even though it had low tidal volume, um, the uh, compliance was very low at 27. Uh, so as we progressed 12 hours later, now driving pressure has dropped to 9.1, but even though tidal volume has gone up to 9.2 because the, the uh, compliance has gone up to 59, and <clears throat> when we get the lung fully open to 24 hours, uh, driving pressure is normal, and so it is the compliance. Uh, in this is second brain dead lung donor uh, with conventional ventilation, we saw we had a uh, driving pressure 26, and you can see a very bad looking x ray. <clears throat> in three hours with TCAB, uh, driving pressure dropped to 17, x ray starting to improve, 29 hours, driving pressure 14, uh, lung x rays looking very good, and at 84 hours down to 11, and again, a very nice looking x ray. <clears throat> so, this is an example of how the TCAB method is. Um, uh, uh, adaptive and personalized. It's personalized to each patient's uh, lung condition, and uh, the tidal volume will fluctuate. Uh, it'll be very low with a collapsed injur uh, injured lung, and as the lung opens, it'll, it'll increase, and driving pressure will always drop as the lung opens. And this was another uh, case uh, study in a uh, ECMO patient at upstate and uh, it uh, had ECMO for 15 days and uh, standard uh, PCAC low tidal volume for 21 days, uh, uh, PO2 and PF ratio 59 and 196 respectively. Uh, continued with this regimen for 30 days, 36 days, uh, PO2 59 and PF ratio now to, down to 75, transferred to a TCAB for, ju <clears throat> for just two days. Uh, PO2 up to 110, PF ratio up to 275, and notice the improvements in x-ray, and <clears throat> uh, TCAB at 11 days, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, PF ratio of 107, and, uh, or PO2 of 107, PF ratio of one, uh, 14, this patient was decannulated, extubated, and went home. So uh, will the TCAB method be effective on patients with COVID-19 induced ARDS? I think would be the big question. Um, and uh, Dr. Habashi and I, along with uh, Dr. Camperata and Gatto, uh, have uh, a page, paper in submission called the title of Pathophysiology of SARS COVID Induced Acute Lung Injury. Uh, it's in second submission, and I think it should be accepted uh, after this uh, after this submission, and hopefully will be out in a very few months. Uh, in this paper, we recommend using TCAB for um, COVID-19 patients, <clears throat> and the uh, protocols uh, to use TCAB will be published as uh, supplements in this paper. Um, <clears throat> there is a, a very recent publication uh, by Dr. Joseph. Uh, in which he, uh, in which they used, it's just a pilot study, but they used um, uh, airway pressure release ventilation, and it was set and adjusted in a very uh, TCAB-like manner uh, for COVID patients. Uh, so what they did is they transitioned uh, COVID patients with uh, eight, that uh, to APRV uh, 24 hours after there was no improvement on low tidal volume ventilation, <clears throat> and there was 10 of these patients. Uh, when they transitioned, they, the P high was two centimeters above uh, P plateau and uh, uh, and low tidal volume strategy. Uh, the T high was uh, five seconds, uh, P low was zero, and the T low was set to terminate expiration 75% of the peak expiratory flow, which again is um, the TCAP method. <clears throat> and what they found is that APRV significantly reduced the FiO2 vasopressor sedation in analgesics and significantly increase PF ratio, uh, the, the PF ratio. They, uh, this group recommended an RCT using APRV uh, on COVID-19 patients would uh, be indicated from, indicated from this pilot study. So in summary for the whole lecture, uh, I think the key thing is to think of the lung parenchymal tissue uh, as a viscoelastic system. There's always gonna be a delay from the time you apply the tidal volume and the lung opens or you exhale and the, and the lung collapses. 
uh, thus a long inspiratory time would open up a uh, lung and a short expiratory time would not give the lung to, rec uh, to recollapse and therefore you would have an open stable lung uh, which would reduce these stress multipliers. Uh, our TCAV method uses the inspiratory and expiratory uh, component of time to its advantage, understanding the viscoelasticity of pulmonary tissue uh, in order to uh, keep the lung open and stable. Uh, the TCAV method uh, is the most studied method of all for setting, the studied and published method for st setting uh, APRV. Uh, we have multiple clinically applicable uh, animal studies published. Uh, we have the human case reports in ECMO and grade and lung donors. We have a human meta-analysis on SICU trauma patients. Uh, as I demonstrated, it's personalized and adaptive. Uh, both the tidal volume adapts as the, lung is, uh, as the lung improves or gets sicker, and also the expiratory duration, uh, since it's set uh, by the expiratory flow curve, is specific uh, to that patient and changes as the lung gets better or worse. Um, the TCAV method, uh, according to the Dr. Joseph paper, uh, actually may be infected, may be uh, highly effective in COVID-19 patients. Uh, so, can mechanical ventilation reduce uh, ventilator-induced lung injury? At least in our laboratory and in our, uh, in our and other other clinical studies, it's shown that uh, TCAV works very well on patients. Uh, however, uh, conventional not so much. And again, I, I also want to list our mechanistic studies for uh, TCAV uh, and our uh, reviews. And uh, all of the and uh, uh, many of these papers are can be found on our uh, APRV network. And uh, this is the website. And if you uh, click on the yellow bar, um, uh, when you go to this website, you can just sign in, which is free, and uh, you can get all of the uh, TCAV protocols. <coughs> And uh, I think that's the uh, end of my session. And I will pass it over to Dr. Abashi now, and then I'll be available at the end of uh, his session to uh, answer questions. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Winnie. Thanks, Gary. I think what I'd like to do is uh, essentially build on what, what Gary has discussed already, a little bit of an overlap, but I want to go in to a little bit more clinical discussion. Uh, and I'm gonna go ahead and start with a, a um, case report here. And what I wanna do is just walk through this a little bit more with uh, a greater sort of clinical granularity to sort of discuss how you would actually set APRV. I think one of the issues that we've encountered is that everyone believes that the standard setting should be applied to all patients regardless of the severity of their illness and so what i want to walk you through is that when you are dealing with a rescue situation as we are dealing with this patient this patient's on 90 percent on conventional ventilation you can see they're essentially on a prvc mode and what we want to do is we want to stabilize the patient when we transition we don't want to uh, actually suddenly drop the airway pressure. You know, certainly uh, you may not be happy with an airway pressure of 39, uh, but the problem is you can't just give a breath or two of APRV and expect everything to change dramatically. We have to work the lung towards better compliance, better alveolar stability and alveolar recruitment, which is not the same thing as PO2, which I'll discuss later. But here you can see this is a patient on, on PRVC. And just to show you, this patient's undergoing low tidal volume strategy. You can see the 6 mLs per kg. And we have a, uh, a rate um, that's 20. And we've got a minute ventilation of 8.3 liters. And so when we transition, we're going we're gonna to take that plateau pressure because this is a pressure mode. And essentially, the peak airway pressure and the plateau are similar. So you can see we've transitioned to a P-high of 39, we're still on 90% FiO2. And now you can see our settings here. And most importantly, you wanna make sure your T-low is set appropriately. And we'll talk about why you would set it this way. But as you can see, initially the setting was 0.45. And you can see that the tidal volume is already less than the six mLs per kg. And if you look carefully here, we have a somewhat of an instability of that deceleration of the expiratory gas flow. 
So this is actually not uh, adjusted adequately. So we need to adjust this a little bit more. And so you're gonna see we're gonna do that again. And here you can see that we reduced it from 0.45 to 0.40. And now we're much closer to that termination that we want and all the passive deflations are essentially the same. And now we can see that our tidal volume is, is 5.3. And I think this is important. Some of the data that Gary showed where we did uh, normal pigs and we made them septic for 48 hours. Well, we started with normal lungs. And so the settings that we use were uh, more typical of normal lungs. And now you're just trying to maintain the lung in a normal position. In these rescue situations, we have to gradually get to those settings. And of course, a lot of what we do with APRV combines a diffusive ventilation and a convective or a bulk flow movement of gas. And of course, the bulk flow is gonna be the release of the airway pressure. So these intermittent releases cause a physical movement of carbon dioxide versus holding the breath and letting the gas equilibrate in the distal air spaces. And of course, the longer time we have, the better that is for that process to occur. However, when you've got essentially white lungs and uh, you don't have a lot of surface area, you can't really hope for a lot of diffusive gas exchange in the beginning. So we are sort of forced to bulk ventilate that patient. And that's why uh, we, you can see the T high here is, is two. Now that gives us a pretty high rate, but we can see here that uh, um, the frequency is 25. And the reason is anytime we optimize the T low, we've saved all this extra time, this unnecessary expiratory phase, and then we can just transfer whatever time we save into the other category, which is to actually maintain that pressure for a longer time to allow that viscoelastic behavior to sort of, uh, you know, uh, work in terms of creating alveolar stability. And again, you can see that the tidal volume is less because the, the way you would set APRV to 75%, frequently you're gonna see tidal volumes that are much less than six mLs when the lung is sick. Over time, you can see that uh, we've made some adjustments here gradually just to maintain this time. And again, the 75% is protocolized, but the time is not, it's personalized. And that's because this relies on the recoil force of the lung. And as the recoil is increased, we need a shorter time. As the recoil improves, then we can actually extend the time somewhat. And that is gonna be correlated with elastance. The stiffer your lung is, the more recoil force it has. And if, if you wanna think about it, I think in a more proper way, rather than thinking of compliance, you might wanna just think of elastance as pulling a spring apart. Now, if you take your, uh, your ballpoint pen and take that spring out and kind of move it, it's pretty easy to pull that apart and let it go back. But if it's a really thick spring, it's going to be much harder to pull it apart. And then when you let go, it's going to have a tremendous recoil force related to the elastance. Now, again, over time, uh, you can see that our tidal volumes are actually starting to, to get bigger. And of course, the gas exchange at this point is actually getting better. And you'll see that the PCO2 will continue to go down. That usually triggers your ability to increase the T high. And once, once you do that, that allows you then ultimately to decrease the P high. And you can see now where um, our tidal volumes are up a little more. This is the next day. And now you can see that we're finally getting to the point where our tidal volumes are bigger. And now we can actually start working on the P high. And you can see that at 0.43, this is a little too tight in terms of the peak expiratory flow. So that is gonna allow us to do the next move here. So you can still see 75% protocolized, but now it's 0.53 and our airway pressure is gradually coming down. And our tidal volumes, as they get bigger, we can continue to sort of work these parameters. The main manipulation is really here, which enables you to lower the applied pressure. Now I don't have the very first X-ray, this is sort of, midway so 
Unfortunately, it was a rather white x-ray, but you can see over time, things are clearing up quite a bit. Now, what I laid out for you is, to recap, is that because you are personalizing the time, and you're using time as the controller of end expiration, end expiratory lung volume, if you use 75%, what that means is as the lung recoil is greater, you're gonna to have to use a shorter and shorter time. Well, flow over time is volume, and that means that the T low adjust towards uh, a smaller tidal volume when you have more recoil. So in other words, we are now putting this together with the mechanics of the lung. And that's because the tidal volume that you select is really an arbitrary concept. In fact, it doesn't really go along with the amount of lung injury you have. In fact, you can have two patients with identical body weight, but the degree of lung injury is not gonna be standardized. Someone's gonna have more lung injury or have a, let's, let's use the, the actual terms, someone's baby lung is gonna be smaller than someone else's baby lungs. In fact, I'll show you a, a, some dynamic CAT scans of two patients with identical body weight. And you can just see, if we wanna just go back to the baby lung concept, you can see there's a, quite a difference in the irritable lung volume. So you don't wanna necessarily put six mLs in all patients just on their body weight, you would rather correlate that with their mechanics. And because their mechanics correlates better with the way the, uh, how much tidal volume you can actually put in the lung. In fact, here's another, these are recons uh, from CAT scans looking at Hounsfield units and determining how much of the lung has normal aeration. And these are all, all three patients have the same body weight and would predict to have a tidal volume of 420 based on body weight but you can see that the um, lung is really quite different in terms of how much is aeratable. So I'm not so sure six mLs always make sense. When the lung is healthier, it probably doesn't. When the lung is sicker, it probably doesn't. It's sort of a number that was chosen. In fact, if you go back to the original description of the baby lung in 1987, uh, which was done with several patients uh, undergoing CAT scan and they calculated the aeratable lung volume, what they found was that it actually correlated with compliance. So how much lung volume you have to inflate correlates with compliance. So in a similar sense, what we're doing with TCAV is we are allowing not you to pick the tidal volume, but the lung mechanics to pick the tidal volume. You're just not gonna get a bigger volume in a, in a sicker lung. It'll be frequently less than six. So that's, that's an important idea. And what I wanna do is just take a moment to sort of describe APRV and actually more or less explain why we decided to make a, a term like uh, an acronym like TCAV because APRV just wasn't providing enough descriptive uh, analysis of what you're doing with the ventilator. As you know, you can set APRV many, many different ways. And this is just an article. If you're interested, you can look through this. At the time, this reviewed all papers that had the term APRV in them. And what we found was the majority of these uh, papers are really pressure control and not really APRV where you're actually trying to do everything I just outlined in terms of the uh, TLO. So here's an example. You can see how limited an acronym is. We have pressure control and we have APRV. And based on the fact that the terms are different, you know, T INSP instead of T high, uh, you can create a rate of 10 and a PEEP of 10, but I can do a P low of 10 and I can do a rate of uh, a, a T high of five and a T low of, uh, of one second. And actually I can create essentially the same uh, rate, a rate of 10. And if you look at the airway profile, they're identical. So it's not enough to just have an acronym popping up on the ventilator. You need to go a little deeper and say, well, what are we trying to do with the lung? And how can we manipulate the behavior of the lung in a more favorable direction? How can we sort of get it to stabilize and move, move in the right direction? So here you can see that uh, this is very typical of some of the studies 
that uh, I think confuse the literature. To, to, so in order to get, you know, more serious about the literature, in order to actually study something scientifically, we have to be able to describe it beyond APRV. So within the APRV mode, because obviously we want these controllers, we want to be able to control time. Now what we want to do is highlight that we are in fact controlling time, so time control. And because the TLO is giving you information as uh, opposed to say, let's say the PEEP FIO2 scale. And uh, if you remember during COVID, some of the big issues that were had was people were chasing the PO2 with higher and higher PEEP, but the compliance may not have been as bad, at least initially. And so there was a disconnect there. Whereas in TCAV, it's looking at the compliance, it's monitoring the compliance on a breath to breath basis. And you're able then to adjust that more appropriately for that. So that's the adaptive part. And that adaptive part is going to evolve not only for a given patient or be different for a given patient, but throughout the patient's evolution of their disease process. As they get worse, the TLO will generally get shorter. As they get better, it'll get longer. So those are the, some of the reasons why we wanted to use the term adaptive ventilation. Now here's a, a more typical example, and again, highlighting the TLO. And I have to uh, stress that this TLO, in order to understand APRV or TCAV uh, well, you need to understand how you're manipulating time. And most importantly, I would say how you're manipulating that TLO. And there's the reason for that is uh, many of the things that Gary highlighted, and I'm going to go over that again with this with these clinical ideas in mind but you have to stop the de-recruitment before you start the recruitment if you recruit the lung you are now going to create more lung units that can become unstable so our first step is always making sure that TLO is set appropriately for that moment in time when that patient's mechanics dictate that 75% Now, this is a, a paper we uh, recently did, so I'm just gonna kind of review this paper a little bit. Gary kind of went over this, but I wanted to put this out there if you're interested in sort of um, understanding it a little bit more. This might be a reasonable paper to start with. Uh, we try to highlight a lot of these discussions. I'm just gonna summarize it here just for the sake of uh, uh, tying in all this information. I do wanna stress a little bit more about the adaptive nature of the TLO and why it's so critical. And I want to explain that uh, for many years now, going back to the 1940s, people have understood that passive recoil of the thorax and the lungs creates a slope, and that slope correlates with elastance. So remember, elastance would be how hard it is to pull that spring apart. And as your recoil forces increase in order your slope will become more acute you can see here that as you go to severe ARDS it's much steeper and that's why if you want to use 75 percent you can't possibly use the same T low see it's 0 0.5 point in, in this example and here you can also see that we have uh, a tidal volume which is really since the Y axis is flow, and the X axis here is time, you can see that the area encompassing this is really the tidal volume. And you can see how the tidal volume goes along with a stiff lung, and as the lung gets better, the, the tidal volume will increase. So you don't have a, you don't get to pick the volume, the mechanics sort of determine the volume. And uh, as I said before, the, the more severe lung disease you have, in rescue situations, it's very rare to be more than six mLs per kg. In fact, most of the time, you're somewhere between four and five mLs per kg. And as things get better, that tends to get better. And you can see these angles. So we're gonna use these angles to monitor uh, the breath-to-breath -breath recall force of the lung, and we're gonna adjust it accordingly. Now, of course, if you don't let the lung empty, and of course, we don't use a pressure, a PLO, we use simply time. But of course, if you use time, 
and you essentially uh, release some of the pressure. So when we release the pressure, we're not letting the flow go all the way to zero. So what that means is we're retaining some of the P high. So we're just bleeding off some of the P high and we're going back up. So you could easily say, well, measure that and use that as PEEP. And in fact, we did uh, just to illustrate the fact that time in of itself is an essential component, even though if you indirectly produce a pressure, because of course we're not gonna let the lung go all the way to zero. So here you're gonna see the difference of between set PEEP and time control PEEP. So that's the difference here. And so you have, uh, on this side, you have the airway pressure, and over here you have alveolar volume. So we're watching uh, frame to frame with a, a special camera, we're watching the air spaces close, and we're gonna measure how quickly they close. And the first thing we're gonna do is set the, I'm gonna injure the lung, and we're going to set the time high, the time low to produce 75%. And so I'll start with that, and that's going to be the time control PEEP here. Uh, and so you can see that the PEEP, the pressure drops, which is here in the with the dotted line, and that stops uh, just a little bit above 15. And then because the, the release time is brief, that ends and we go back up on our airway pressure. So you're actually looking at the release phase right here. Now, if you look at conventional uh, uh, pressure, this dotted line here, you're gonna drop roughly to the same PEEP. The PEEP is maintained. So that's the, the equivalent pressures. So they both have the same end expiratory pressure. And now we're gonna look at alveolar volume. So that's gonna be these solid lines here. So you can see that as soon as you take the pressure away, alveoli tend to wanna to close down. And with, with TCAV, it stops. And with PEEP, it doesn't stop. Even though you're holding pressure, your alveoli continue to shrink underneath the cover of pressure. So that suggests that there's an independent controller of time. Now this is not yet published, but these are uh, studies we're uh, gonna be concluding very soon. Now I just wanna show you the videos. So this is after lung injury, and this is with a TILO of, a, a TILO set to 75% of the peak expiratory flow. And this is generating 15 to 16 centimeters of pressure. Now we'll go over to the uh, PEEP, and you can see how you have much more airway closure during that time. So we've been able to determine, and actually some other experiments we've, we've done, in order to get the same stability, you need significantly higher PEEP levels than the PEEP you're gonna generate by maintaining the uh, TLO at 75%. Now, another aspect that I want to discuss is not only can we look at the waveforms and essentially create a cutoff time. So here we have the release, and here's the peak expiratory flow, and then there's going to be a deceleration of flow until we get all the way to zero. But if we just arbitrarily stop the flow right here, we can project what the end expiratory lung volume would be. Now, if you then have a patient that becomes sicker, with the same TLO, what ends up happening is the tidal volume may be large, but the end expiratory lung volume is actually getting quite small. And we know that from stress strain studies, regardless of tidal volume, that if your tidal volume is greater than 50%, equal to or greater than 50% of your end expiratory lung volume, you're increasing lung strain regardless of that tidal volume. So what that means is if we reduce the time, we immediately make the tidal volume smaller and we increase the end expiratory lung volume. That way we have some gas in the lung at end expiration. And this may not be a good analogy, but you can think of it, we have a significant amount of air in our lung during exhalation. And that accommodates the next tidal breath. And that breath is pushed onto the existing air in our lung and sort of dampened. Uh, bad analogy, but uh, let's say there's an airbag in your lung 
absorbing some of that energy from the tidal breath. But if your lung is really degassed, then now you're going to load that directly onto the tissue. So as Gary said, and we did this editorial, is time the missing component? And what I want to discuss is not only is time the missing component or a key component because of the fact that the lung is a time dependent organ, both on the inspiratory side and the expiratory side, and we can use it without paying a real significant price in terms of energy load into the lung, such as plateau pressure or tidal volume or any of those things. We can utilize this variable to achieve stability without the uh, excessive PEEP or excessive plateau pressures or even, even using tidal side breaths for that matter. Now, Gary already went through this, but I, I think it's worthwhile understanding the viscoelastic behavior and what we're trying to do and why, why we call it time control is because we do want to highlight that one of the key features here is that you're trying to control the time and as precisely as you can. Now, initially, uh, what you're going to be trying to do if you have a, a uh, severe patient, you know, that patient may require groups of lung units becoming stable over time rather than trying to stabilize the whole lung with one breath. And so that's why you want to gradually extend your time once you're beyond that point of adequate minute ventilation to make sure your patient is not hypercarbic. I think that's definitely one of the clinical problems we see is that people think that all patients should have a rate of 10. If you're post-operative and healthy, you should have a rate of 10 and you're on the ventilator, if you are in have severe COVID disease, you should have a rate of 10. And that's just not how it works. You have to get there, and you have to go through the steps. Now, that usually takes some time. So we're trying to exploit this viscoelastic behavior. And on the release side, we want to be able to remove carbon dioxide through convection or the physical movement of gas, carbon dioxide, without moving the lung. That's what we're trying to achieve. We don't want a lot of dynamic strain, meaning a big inflation and a, and a complete deflation. We're trying to minimize that dynamic strain. And I'll just show you some examples. Here's a rat lung, and you can see that this is 75%. And you can see this is actually just basically twitching. Let's move up to a slightly bigger animal. Here's a pig, and you can see when the release comes, you can see that we're really trying to just induce the minimum amount of inflation, I'm sorry, deflation in the, in the lung, and we're, our real goal is to essentially accomplish carbon dioxide removal. In fact, uh, I still think you need to move the lung. There's probably some other reasons for that, and uh, maybe it has some, something to do with surfactants and so on. These are all theories. Uh, but to some extent, we're trying to create the minimal amount of movement in the parenchyma. Now, of course, you don't need to take the patient's lungs out of their chest and put it on the table next to their bed. You can simply just look at their chest wall, and I'll just show you a patient who is uh, completely passive because they just came back from the operating room, and you can see that there's the release. You can see the chest moves very slightly during a passive release. And so now the question is, when we look at that ventilator screen, what do we really see? And I think that's really important uh, because as Gary mentioned and as I mentioned to you, when we look at that ventilator and we say, oh, the ventilator is, we're using lung protective ventilation. Is that really telling us the whole story? In fact, if you look at some of the evolutions of the thoughts about separating the components of ventilator-induced lung injury because we've never really taken that task of trying to quantify what does what, what starts it, what's the catalyst, what is the proportion in terms of over-distension, let's say, or recruitment, de-recruitment. Well, if we go along with the idea that one of the instigating features is alveolar instability or a de-recruitment, recruitment phenomena, 
we're not going to be able to see that on the ventilator. We also don't know how the tidal volume, even if it's considered protective, where is that going? How is one lung, which is normal, versus a diseased lung, which is abnormal, going to accept that breath? And that's really the deeper question. It's not simply just looking at the ventilator and saying, we're protected and we're okay. It may be a much deeper thought process. And I think that unless we understand that distal phenomena, because that's where the injury occurs, it doesn't actually occur in the ventilator circuit or uh, to some extent in the airways. It really results in the parenchymal injury. And so we need to understand that better. Now, uh, Gary showed some of these videos. I wanted to show you the article that, where they were published. And there's videos there so that you can look at them or download them. Uh, but essentially, we're taking that model of normal lung and essentially saying, well, how does the normal lung handle it? And if we understand how the normal lung handles it, how does the abnormal lung handle it? And is there any way to make an abnormal lung behave more like a normal lung? And that's really one of the things that we've tried to understand in, a, in greater depth. And not only that, in order to make a clinical difference, we need something that is available at the bedside. It doesn't require any fancy tools. It just requires your understanding of, of recoil force, elastins, how the lung empties, and then you have a real-time breath-to-breath monitor that you can actually titrate with some guideline. Dissociated from oxygenation, because that's not necessarily physiologic, and so that's what we're trying to do. And again, Gary showed this. I just think it's important enough to re-emphasize this is how your lung, the architecture of your lung, the ultrastructure of your lung is not balloons. They are more of these types of shapes. Let's call them a, um, um, a, a sides that, ha that meet at angles. Uh, essentially, they don't really have a rounded uh, uh, component to them. They may look rounded. We have surfactant, which creates a rounded shape. But for the most part, this is the shape. It's more of a hexagon uh, or a honeycomb structure. But probably the most important thing is what's called alveolar interdependence. And you can see this interdependence is that they share alveolar walls. And the lung is reasonably stable and very resistant to deflation and inflation extremes because the forces are equilibrated over this whole area. But unfortunately, if we create an instability in, in this structure, it's going to have a ripple effect on this whole area. And this is, again, what Gary showed you, but it's really important to stress this. And I want to uh, highlight something else, which is that and, and these are taken from sort of biological models, just easier to see when you're looking at this. The degree of stretch worsens during the expiration. You know, we all think that inspiration is the, is the time that you're going to overdescend that baby lung. But as Gary pointed out, what we're probably doing, dealing with is not a, a uh, half the lung is a baby lung and the other half is a diseased lung. And what we're seeing is islands of areas of instability that branch out and then create an effect on their neighbors. And I think that's important. And actually, several other investigators have shown that these stress concentrators are not located in just one part of the lung. They go and they're in multiple areas of the lung that have nothing to do with sort of that baby lung classic distribution that's been discussed. Now I'm going to use some biological uh, data here and I just want to again highlight the fact that if you don't stop the instability you're going to potentially create the opportunity for over distension and then once you destroy that lung you're going to create more instability and do the same thing and that's why we need a bedside tool. Remember there's nothing on the ventilator that says alveolar instability. It's silent. It's clinically silent. We don't know it's happening until things look really bad and then we reach for all kinds of modes of ventilation, we reach for ECMO, we reach for all kinds of strategies, but it's very insidious and it occurs 
as soon as you start ventilating a patient potentially and leading to some injury. So we're gonna look at a particular area here and I wanna again highlight what Gary talked about which is a stress concentrator. So I'm just doing this slide for slide. This lung unit is collapsing, again using uh, uh, slow motion filming. And you can see how the neighbors are getting elongated as they fill the space that was once occupied by this unstable lung unit. And eventually what happens is those yellow areas are just another way to express the stress concentration of energy that has resulted in these elongations. And you can see multiple islands of, of stress uh, concentration or stress multipliers. And that's what uh, essentially leads to further and further propagation of injury. Gary also mentioned this. Again, I wanna highlight this simply because uh, we believe if you don't stop this, it can have the ability to, to ripple through the lung entirely and just keep marching on and on. And once lung units are damaged, then you're actually setting up the next round of lung units to be damaged. So we need to stop that process. We need to reverse that process. And again, that's why I would tell you, you have to stop the de-recruitment before you create recruitment. Because if you create recruitment, you're just gonna create more unstable lung units. That's one of my issues with recruitment maneuvers and all these other sort of transient steps that you may get a PO2 signal, but it does not mean that, that the lung is stable. Alveolar stability is not in the moment of PO2 rise. It takes hours, hours for the lung to go from de-recruited and unstable to open and stable. That's not gonna happen with a 40 second uh, maneuver. So we've certainly talked about uh, several uh, papers that we've done about uh, if you just simply set this in, in the TCAV method, we've definitely received, uh, have a signal clinically, uh, histologically, biochemically, uh, surfactant, inflammatory response. And again, we don't have enough time to go through all these papers, but to suffice it to say that we've been able to correlate or calibrate that T low set at 75% so that we have some marker at the bedside that says, okay, we have prevented that de-recruitment, recruitment, and now we can build on recruitment and stabilizing the lung. Just a quick example of, of the comparisons. Uh, again, this is just one of many studies that we've done looking at this. And ultimately, I think that's where I'm gonna stop to make sure we have time for questions. Thank you so very much for that presentation. Excellent.